Attempting to create a sustainable sports car that would break the planned obsolescence of the Detroit Big Three, Malcolm Bricklin, a long-standing figure in the American corporate world, developed from a small New Brunswick shipping warehouse what was meant to be the market-beating sports car for the mid-1970s, that being the eponymous Bricklin SV1, a low-slung and stylish machine that featured such futuristic facets as electronically controlled gullwing doors and a molded body. However, the SV-1, despite its original ambitions, would not be the success hoped for by Bricklin, as through a mixture of hubris, misguided aspirations, limitations to the existing technology, political intrigue, and a somewhat ambivalent approach by its original progenitor, what was supposed to be a Corvette beater instead became but a footnote of the motoring scene. The Bricklin SV-1 was the creation of the eponymous Malcolm Bricklin who had used his family's wealth to undertake various entrepreneurial ventures throughout the 1950s and 60s, including Handyman America, a hardware retailer that collapsed controversially during 1960 due to poor management decisions and a competition from cheaper alternatives, with Bricklin having sold his share of the business to his corporate partners only days before its liquidation to escape the financial fallout. After this, he moved into the realm of automobiles taking up the role of an importer for the obscure Subaru 360 economy car, a facsimile of the Volkswagen Beetle, but one that failed to pass American safety trials, where it was found that, after a low-speed collision with a typical domestic model, the front bumper of the 360 would end up inside the passenger cabin, thus leading to the failure of the import deal. Regardless, Bricklin moved forward into car building itself, inspired somewhat by the futuristic-looking jet cars that were depicted in his children's TV shows, as well as his disenchantment with the planned obsolescence endemic within the design and build practices of America's big three auto builders. Thus, he too would resolve to create his own low-slung sports car with gull-wing doors that would be economical, efficient, and present revolutionary safety features, while at the same time bucking the trend of contemporary American models by having a life expectancy of well over a decade, rather than the maximum of four to five years commonly experienced among its proposed rivals, such as Chevrolet Corvettes and Ford Mustangs. The car he proposed would feature gullwing doors, a frugal small-capacity engine, and a steel cage that would headline a raft of safety features, including heavy-duty bumpers that would shrug off impacts, while power would come from a diminutive but strong four-cylinder engine. Due to real estate in Detroit being incredibly expensive, he followed the advice of a close friend to set up shop in the rural province of New Brunswick in the far northeast of Canada, New Brunswick's main industries at the time being fishing, oil extraction and agriculture, all of which were facing severe decline and thus unemployment stood at 13% among a population of 634,000 people, accounting for approximately 82,000 people. During 1970, Richard Hatfield was elected Premier for the region and was determined to introduce new industry to the area in whatever way was possible. The combination of Hatfield's desire to help fund new industry in the province and the low cost of real estate being enough to convince Bricklin to meet with the political leader, whereupon the Premier agreed to invest an initial $6 million of state funds into the project. Eventually, Bricklin would site his production facility inside an old shipping warehouse in the seaport city of St. John but this structure was not ideal for the mass assembly of cars as it featured large holes in the floor and also had a notably low roof that restricted the height of jigs and other equipment. As for the car, his initial plan was to fit a four-cylinder power plant, but discussions with AMC led to an agreement to supply 5.9-litre V8s instead, one of which was installed in the prototype constructed by custom car builder Dick Dean, which he unveiled at the end of 1972. The original Bricklin prototype was not a running car, merely being a mock-up that would be used to encourage the first Pennsylvania bank to invest $950,000, while Bricklin himself would go headhunting among the big three for design and construction staff, as well as embarking on a highly effective promotional campaign. Over the coming months, Bricklin would spread the word of his new car via TV, magazines, newspapers and radio, leading to an order of at least 2,000 units being made for the machine, despite the fact that a running prototype hadn't even been built yet, with Bricklin's team working feverishly to create four working examples. 
The prototype assembly stage was wrought with problems, though, specifically revolving around the gullwing doors, as due to each door weighing approximately 90 pounds, equivalent to a 12-year-old child, they had to be electrically assisted. But due to the trade-off between size, weight, and lifting capabilities, the electric motors would take up to 40 seconds to open and close the doors. Furthermore, due to the severe power draw of the electric motors, the car's battery would frequently run dry, leaving occupants locked inside with no choice but to escape via the rear hatch, which, beyond general inconvenience, raised critical safety problems in the event of a rollover, while another common problem was the failure of the latches to open the door when the electric motors were operating, due to their poor quality build causing them to become stuck, thus leading to the hydraulic rams disfiguring the latches as they tried to push open the door regardless. Beyond the gullwing doors, another major innovation of what was now dubbed the Brooklyn SV-1 or Safety Vehicle 1 was its steel cage, over which a series of glass fiber panels were draped, each covered in an acrylic skin that gave the car its colorful finish. This, however, was another new technology that Brooklyn struggled to perfect, with extreme cold or heat likely to crack the panels, while the production process was of such poor quality that over a quarter of the panels made had to be disposed of straight from the moulds, other common glitches with the SV-1 being non-functioning pop-up headlights and windscreens that would fall out. Regardless of these issues, and with the Detroit Big Three being highly unimpressed with the proposed SV-1, considering its general underpinnings to be very primitive despite its futuristic facets, Brooklyn sought the assistance of aspiring Ford designer Herb Grass to help him redesign the original non-running prototype into a road-going machine. However, Grass was kept under significant pressure to deliver the running prototype, as unlike the regular timescale of three to five years for the development of a new car, Brooklyn wanted all the engineering completed within 90 days, as he was playing an elaborate game of bluff with his financiers, who would regularly stop by to check on their investment. This led to perhaps the biggest stumbling block for the SV-1, aside from its other construction glitches, the design of the tail lights, with Grass having less than a day to complete the car, eventually removing the lights from his own Di Tommaso Pantera sports car and fitting them onto the Brooklyn prototype, a choice that worked so well that Pantera tail lights were incorporated into all production models. Converting the original prototype, dubbed the Red Car, into a production model was one riddled with trouble and strife, as aside from the ever-present issue of the electric gullwing doors and the poor quality panel mouldings, the single radiator opening on the original production model made the car prone to overheating, while the use of incorrect suspension springs caused the car to bottom out. The biggest problem, however, was Bricklin himself, who would often disappear to his Arizona ranch in order to pursue his childhood dreams of being a cowboy, leaving the management of the company in the hands of his family members, each of whom had little experience in the automotive industry, leading to poor financial and directorial decisions that Brooklyn would refuse to challenge out of loyalty. This, combined with the many mechanical and logistical problems, meant the firm was teetering on bankruptcy before even the first car had been built, with the significant debts of the company being paid off by increasingly large state injections from Hatfield's government. Finally, after much delay, the Brooklyn SV-1 was launched at the Four Seasons Hotel in New York City in June 1974, but this too was wrought with trouble, as against Brooklyn's original vision of having three cars positioned on the iconic fountains inside the lobby, he soon found that the cars were one inch too wide to fit through the front doors. Thus, at 1am, Brooklyn ordered a giant spit to be hastily assembled and used to slide the cars sideways through the doors the three demonstrators being moved into position in the nick of time, and through a mixture of Brooklyn's charisma, as well as the car's striking design, he was able to garner 40,000 orders from dealerships across the United States and Canada by the end of the day. This was followed days later by Brooklyn and Hatfield opening the new Brunswick factory, demonstrating to the gathered press and public a running and driving SV-1, which in reality was a handmade custom one-off and the only functioning Bricklin SV-1 in the world, though regardless, this act of subterfuge paid off, and hype for the project remained strong as the local population eagerly pitched in. The Bricklin SV-1 would enter the marketplace in the summer of 1974, 
the first customer units trickling off the production line during the August of that year, as assembled by a team of 750 people who had never previously worked in car construction. However, orders continued to mount, while 247 dealers were now signed up to the Brooklyn SV-1, the New Brunswick government continuing to inject more and more cash into the upkeep of the project, regardless of the fact that the first units coming off the assembly line illustrated such a plethora of faults that they were completely unacceptable for sale. Nevertheless, the Brooklyn SV-1 came in five vibrant colors, red, green, suntan, white, and orange, with most examples being ordered with a Chrysler three-speed automatic transmission, though a few were also fitted with a four-speed manual gearbox. 1974 seeing all cars featuring AMC's 220 horsepower engine from the AMC Rebel and the Jeep Cherokee, while for 1975, Brooklyn shifted to Ford's 175 horsepower 5.75 liter Windsor V8 from the Ford Mustang. Eventually, after three months, the first SV1s that could be considered fit for public consumption rolled off the production line and were soon being shipped to all corners of North America. Though while on paper the car had promise against the likes of the Chevrolet Corvette and the Ferrari Berlinetta Boxer, the reality was very different due to the incredible weight of the motors that drove the electronic gullwing doors. 0-60 came in 9.9 .9 seconds, and it would struggle to make 110 miles an hour, while the rival Corvette C3 would achieve a 0-60 time of 5.5 seconds at a top speed of 123 miles an hour. Its problems compounded by its meager 12 mile per gallon fuel consumption, which not only stood up poorly against the Corvette's MPG rating, but filled potential customers with dread amid a market still reeling from the 1973 oil crisis. Finally, there was the retail price, with Brooklyn originally envisaging a $4,000 cost for the SV1 or $25,000 in 2024, which would have made it notably cheaper than the $6,000 Corvette C3. Though with construction costs soaring to $16,000 per unit due to production faults, an inefficient work ethos and mismanagement, the final estimate prior to launch was a base price of $6,500 or $40,600 in 2024 before eventually entering sales at $7,490 or $46,800 in 2024. In the end, prices for the SV-1 reached their peak at $9,980 or $62,400 in 2024 for the base model, which meant by the time the first cars were reaching showrooms and forecourts, the Brooklyn company was again skimming bankruptcy, though Brooklyn and Hatfield worked hard to keep this fact a secret convincing the workforce that they were doing well and creating a viable competitor to the Corvette. As his company struggled due to the poor build of his cars and a lack of commercial interest, the New Brunswick taxpayer continued to foot the bill in increasing quantities, Hatfield having originally agreed to invest $9 million into the project, but when Bricklin kept running out of cash, he requested ever more backing, pointing out the 4,500 advanced orders and 750 workers that were keeping the local economy rolling. Thus, he was able to secure $16 million in backing before the first car left the factory, while production peaked at 420 cars in one month against an original forecast of 1,000 cars per month. The final bill placed to the new Brunswick government in order to keep the Brooklyn SV-1 afloat being almost $20 million. However, Hatfield was able to continue justifying his investment in Brooklyn through its effects on local employment, and as a test of public faith in the car, he called an election for the Premier of New Brunswick in October 1974, placing the SV1 front and centre of his campaign. The result was a substantial victory for Hatfield, and provided the necessary enthusiasm to keep the project rolling, though Brooklyn had feared the possibility of Hatfield not being re-elected, as the opposing Liberal Party had openly stated their intention to sever all funds for the company if they rose to power. Therefore, as a contingency, Brooklyn requested the Premier supply him with a secret government grant of $17 million, most of which was spent paying the rent on the factory that was a year overdue, public opinion of the Brooklyn scheme rapidly shifting when these payments were exposed by way of a leak, and opinion polls in Hatfield dropped considerably following his election victory. 
faith in the company was rumbled, and people began to realise that this huge scheme was barely bringing in a quarter of the revenue it required in order to remain financially buoyant, with very little external or private investment beyond the state of New Brunswick, meaning the Brooklyn Car Company was essentially a nationalised asset. Though 1975 started with an $8 million loan to fund the SV1, the Liberal Party filed a lawsuit against Brooklyn and Hatfield following continued leaks regarding company bailouts, while from the American market, complaints began to arrive regarding build quality issues and multiple engineering faults that remained unaddressed, the biggest concern being with the overheating caused by the inadequate radiator. In an attempt to save face, Brooklyn placed all blame on the inexperienced New Brunswick workforce for the car's faults, thus creating an irreparable rift between himself and Hatfield, who in turn declined to offer any more government bailouts. By the summer of 1975, most dealerships refused to sell any more Brooklyn cars due to the numerous faults, and revenue plummeted. An audit carried out in September of the same year, finding that the company was making a loss of approximately $24 million, with Brooklyn requiring at least $10 million in bailouts in order to keep the company afloat for the next fiscal year. The result was that, following the audit, the government unanimously refused any more bailouts of the Brooklyn company, while Brooklyn and his board of directors came to the decision that there was no hope for the firm, with Hatfield being informed immediately that the company had no future and the Brooklyn SV1 venture had collapsed. In the wake of his company's end, Brooklyn would retreat back to the United States, thus leaving Hatfield to face the wrath of the press and public in New Brunswick, the 200 Brooklyn line workers and other employees being sacked, while demands to restart production by way of state funding, or through some intervention by Brooklyn himself, were not taken forward, the latter having chosen to file for personal bankruptcy. All the remaining assets were taken into receivership by the first Pennsylvania bank, with the leftover equipment and cars being sold at auction for depreciated prices, the outcome of the Brooklyn SV1 project being 2,901 units assembled by the time the factory closed its doors in 1975. As for Hatfield, he would be largely forgiven by the people of New Brunswick, his subterfuge being all part of a valiant effort to reduce unemployment in a disadvantaged part of the world, the Premier going on to be elected for another two terms despite significant later controversy over a drug possession charge and his homosexuality being used as a weapon against him by his political opponents, Hatfield eventually leaving office in 1987 before passing away due to cancer in 1991. For Malcolm Bricklin, he returned to automobiles during the late 1980s by introducing the Yugo 45 and its derivatives to the United States, intending to market the car as an economic alternative to America's own Dodge Colt and Chevy Metro. Though again, this import venture failed to win over buyers, and since then Brooklyn has toyed with electric vehicles and invested in the Chinese Cherry Automobile Company. Today, the Brooklyn SV1, after years of obscurity and generally poor word of mouth, has become a cult classic among vintage car buyers, with approximately 1,700 examples still being known to exist from its short production run though the potential value of these machines continues to remain generally subdued, with survivors fetching an average price of around $25,700. Ultimately, the Brooklyn SV1 is an example of a car that, while technically innovative in many ways, was an exercise of ambition outweighing practicality, with its mixture of cutting-edge body design and electronic gullwing doors pushing the current mechanics of the mid-1970s to their very limits in terms of performance and thereby required the sacrifice of other features within the car that essentially ruined its chances of being truly competitive. This, in combination with Bricklin's somewhat dismissive view of the project during its early conception, leaving it in the hands of his inexperienced family members, as well as the political wranglings of himself and Hatfield in the provision of secret funds to help keep the company afloat once its commercial performance had begun to stagnate, meant the SV1 was destined to become both an overwhelming failure, but also one of the most notable motoring scandals in history.